Hello friends, it's really nice to see you all again. Welcome to session three of the Marriage Builder for Wives. And today um, we are looking at the subject of how do you enact the three strand cord, which you might have a few questions about that particular title, I don't know, uh, but it'll all become clear as we go through. So you're going to need as usual, your Bible, you're going to need a journal and a pen and a teachable spirit and somewhere in the background you're going to need your accountability partner as we go forward. So over the last two sessions we have focused on filia love, being the friend of your husband, providing that assistance and that support in times of hardship or distress. We've considered the qualities of a true friend and the reason we went there was because of Titus 2. Do you remember the instruction that Paul gave Titus to give to the older women, to give to the younger women? How to be, um, how to love your husband as a friend. We also um, asked our husbands what they need from us as a friend. I hope you've done that. If not, it's not too late. You can ask that question. We have focused on, in the second session, we focused on oneness, this profound mystery that the Bible paints for us of the two becoming one. We looked at the metaphor in the Bible of a body and different body parts. We looked at the Sarah Field metaphor, which was a coffee filter. And we looked at the ultimate picture that, again, the Bible paints for us of Christ and the church when it comes to oneness, this profound mystery, this two people together one. We looked at the word cleaving, which is a wonderful word that not only means joining together, but it means pursuing hard after each other throughout the marriage, never causing separation and fighting for the marriage rather than against each other. And just what a different picture that is. So I hope you found that really empowering as you've pondered those ideas. And remember, they're not just for week one or week two, they're for the whole of your marriage. So keep taking them forward, keep reminding yourself and taking them forward. And I can tell you, as I sit here today, hand on heart, that all that stuff that I've just talked about right now, all the stuff we've talked about in the last two weeks, that's the kind of marriage that I want. That's the kind of wife that I truly, truly want to be. Deeply, truly, honestly, I do. And sometimes I am like that. Sometimes I'm a pretty good example of it. Sometimes I am selfless and I am kind and I am a bringer of help and a builder of oneness. Sometimes I do really well <laughs> in those things. But equally, sometimes I act selfishly, I think negatively, I destroy and I pull down and I put a wedge in and I really don't look very much at all like what it is that I have been teaching you. Sometimes that's just the truth. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like, oh my goodness, sometimes I'm nailing it and sometimes I'm the absolute opposite? Do you sometimes feel that? that tension or that division within yourself. Why is it so jolly hard? Well, welcome to this subject, this three-strand cord subject. I want us to go into Romans 7. And the reason I want us to go there today is because Paul knows how hard this sense of, this is what I want, this is what I do is. Now, he wasn't married, so he wasn't referring it into marriage but it's a dilemma that we face in lots of places in our lives. So let's see how he described it in Romans 7, 21 to 25. Paul says this, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man, we would say. What a wretched woman I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Or as other translations put it, who will rescue me from this body of death? Verse 25 Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, centuries ago, some Roman emperors were known to inflict the most hideous punishment of binding the corpse 
uh, the dead body of a murder victim onto the murderer. And this this corpse had to be remain attached to, tightly attached, roped onto the murderer as it rotted away. And the, you can imagine the smell of that and just the feeling of it as this body is decomposing, literally tied to your body. And if anybody else came and, and tried to take that body off you, then they would be put to death. And if you yourself took this body off you, you would be put to death. And this is the picture that we believe that Paul has in mind, because this is what he sees around him, when he talks about this, who will rescue me from this body of death? Everywhere I go, there it is. And I don't like it, and I don't want it, but there it is. This is the picture. Paul is distressed as he talks about it, and I get it. I get that sense of, ah, I don't want it to be like this. We so much want to do what's right, to be this beautiful, godly woman, to be this, this wonderful, godly wife, serving and caring for and loving and being a friend. But right there with us is this body of death. And what that is for us is it is the flesh it is our old self. It is that sin nature that we are strapped to. It's right there with us. But Paul, after describing the distress of this and the concern that he has over this sort of this toing and froing that he senses within, within himself, after he describes it, he goes to what we have as verse 25, thanks be to God. He exclaims that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the deliverer. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ, alive in me by his Holy Spirit, has the power over the dead body, over my flesh. He's victorious. And, and this means two things for me. It means, first of all, it means that the end point is certain. The spirit will win over the flesh. The good will win over the lousy. The flesh has been crucified. The second thing it means is that by his power alive in me, I have the victory day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, as I surrender to, not the flesh, but as I surrender to the Holy Spirit because of Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ's victory over the flesh. So that is our absolute certain hope for the future. And that is our moment by moment, uh, concrete, stand on it, build your life on it kind of hope that we have every moment of our lives, every moment of our marriages really really important to grasp that so without the life of Christ in you the body of the flesh is all that you have but with the life of Christ in you you have spiritual power and victory so with all of that in mind come with me to the verse that we're, that we're going to um, as our key verse today that the title of this subject is based on turn backwards in your Bible to just after just after Proverbs, and you'll get to Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, so if you could find that now. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12. Now just before you get to verse 12, verses 7 through to the first part of 12, this is a section where the writer, King Solomon, has been applauding the value of companionship, the value of friendship, the big idea being that two are better than one. It's better to have a companion, to have a friend in life, than to do life alone. And he gives lots of reasons why. He describes why friendship is just so good. And so you'd think that as he summarizes it, you'd think you'd know how this little part of verse 12, the end of verse 12 might go. It says, a cord of, and you'd think it would say, two strands, meaning the friendship between two, a cord of two strands is not quickly broken. But Solomon doesn't say that. Instead, he jumps that and he goes, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And it's like Solomon right here is hinting at a third party being necessary 
or bringing some added value to a friendship, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now we know, we know that friendship is absolutely essential in a marriage. Oneness, binding together is essential in a marriage. And so when we read this section in the context of the friendship that is within marriage, and we get to the end there, and we see that a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And as we understand that it is God who brings the man and the woman together to become, become this together one, and as we understand that God himself makes that union and is part of that union, then we understand that this verse, when applied to marriage, means that when God is part of your marriage, that cord, that marriage, that relationship is not easily broken. Three is stronger than two. Three intertwining all together, where you can barely see where one begins and one ends, is better and stronger. And when that third strand is literally binding the two together, when that strand is Christ, who is the one who unifies, who breaks down the dividing wall, who is the spirit of peace and who brings oneness, then how true it is that this is better than if it's just the two of you without God. This is a supernatural strand within the cord of marriage. I've got right here my toothbrush. Now, I use an electric toothbrush, and so I have been using an electric toothbrush for a little while now. I used to use just your basic, everyday, manual toothbrush. But since using this electric toothbrush, I have absolutely fallen in love with it. It does such an amazing job. And instead of having to move the brush all around and get into all the little corners and everything like you do with the manual one, you just kind of make sure that this is in your mouth and hitting teeth, and it does all the work for you. But this is made up of two parts, the brush and this piece here that you stand it on. But I tell you what, if I never plugged this toothbrush in, if I never connected it to the power source that is available to it, then really I would be using this in the same way that I would be using this. The electric toothbrush would be really reduced to a manual toothbrush, be no better and it would be missing out on all that's available to it as an electric toothbrush with that power source. And do you know what? Might be a little bit of a corny example, but <laughs> too many Christian wives never learn to connect to the power source. Too many Christian wives treat their marriage as if it is purely and simply natural, and they never plug in. In. They're trying to, they, they, they long for, they try to achieve some kind of miracle marriage, but using only natural ingredients. The power available to them is left dormant. See, the spirit of God can turn a marriage into something supernatural. Now let me just stop for a moment and speak to those of you who are married to someone who is not a follower of Jesus, whom the Spirit of God does not live in. Or those of you who are married to someone who is a follower of Jesus but is not following Jesus, is someone who has professed faith in Christ but is not walking with him, and you don't see any evidence of the Spirit of God alive and at work in them. And you might wonder, well, how does this work for me? Am I a two-strand or a three-strand cord? I want to tell you this, the Spirit of God is in you. The Spirit of God is in you and is in your marriage because he's in you. And you are one with your husband. It's true, just, just like we said last week, it's true for you whether or not he's a follower of Jesus. And you can plug into the power of the Spirit of God in your marriage just like I can. So this session is equally for you. And God knows your situation and he cares, he cares deeply about where you're at. And I would suggest maybe just revisit or go to for the first time 1 Peter chapter 3. Because there's a word in there for you that your husband may end up being won over to Christ because of your love for Christ and your love for your husband, your friendship to him. 
Never underestimate the power of God in you as it overflows into your marriage. Okay, so ladies, how do you plug in? How do you plug in to the power of God in your marriage? How do you really have a power-filled marriage? Well, this is not going to be rocket science, but man, it matters. The first thing is this. You read God's Word. You pick up this book and you daily search it and you allow it to daily search you. And I wonder, is it's, it's said so often, and if you've been a Christian for a while, you've probably heard many, many times the encouragement to read the Bible. But are you actually doing it? Are you actually taking the Bible into yourself every single day and bringing yourself into the Bible? And I know that like for some of you, you're probably in a situation where you can't do that first thing in the day because you've got a baby to feed or a toddler to get breakfast for. But I would suggest that apart from those two reasons, there's probably not really for most of us any reason whatsoever that we cannot put putting God's word into our lives as the first priority for the day. What I find is if I don't, then it doesn't become the first priority, it doesn't become the second, and it's, then it's not the third, and then it's not the fourth, and then before I know it, my whole day is gone. But if you would put this word in, you know, the, the Bible is amazing. Like a light, it casts light on your path, and it shows you where to go, and it gives you direction. And, and it shows you the right steps to take and it shows you the pitfalls. And when it comes to marriage, we all need that. And like a light, it also shows you where you need to clean up. Kind of like when the sun comes pouring in through the windows and you're surprised at the dust that you see lying on, you know, on top of a surface because you couldn't see it before. Or you're surprised by the streaks on the windows that you thought you'd cleaned. Well, the Bible is is a cleansing agent in our lives. It graciously, kindly, but strongly shows us those things in our lives that when it's dark, we don't see, but when the light shines, oh boy, now we see. The Bible is also like a knife in the hand of a surgeon, a knife that is so sharp and so precise that it can remove a life-threatening tumor. The Bible can do this for us, and it might hurt, but the result is life-giving. The Bible is also sweet like honey. It soothes and it heals and it just tastes good and is good for the soul. And we need it so often when we're hurting, when we're dry, when we're discouraged. His word is like honey to our souls. The Bible is God's inspired word to you, to me, to us. As you read it, Allow God, as you're actually reading it, allow him to put his divine finger on what needs attention in you. You see, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that all scripture, all of the Bible, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that you the servant of God may be fully equipped for every good work. It has everything that you need to equip you to, to do all good. You know, recently, as I've been reading the Bible, the Bible has really challenged me about how Jesus lowered himself and became the servant and, and how he teaches that the kingdom of God, we must come in the lowest position. We must constantly be lowering ourselves. And so as the Bible has been speaking this into my life, the divine finger's been pointing to me and saying, come on, girl, you, gotta, you, you can do this. You've got to do this. And, and so what I've been doing is I've been looking for small ways to do this. Because sometimes we think about the grandiose ways. But I think that we can be faithful with the little things first. And so I've been doing things like, and this is crazy, this is mind-blowing stuff, choosing the smaller piece of chocolate so that Nick can have the bigger piece. When I make the coffee in the morning, choosing the one that slops over the edge or that just doesn't quite look like the ideal cup of coffee and giving him the nice one, stuff like that. Now that might sound small to you, but it's not small to me. 
And I actually think it's not all that small to God. And the funny thing is, Nick doesn't even know. But that doesn't matter. Because God's doing something in me. And as I choose to lower myself underneath and become the servant in the relationship, I just think that God is probably at work in me, doing something that he sees and that he thinks is really beautiful. And that's enough for me. So plug into the power source by getting into the Word of God every single day. Oh, it's a treasure. And secondly, plug into the power source by praying. Oh my goodness, if you are not praying for your marriage, you are not plugging it in. What on earth, what on heaven could you be missing out on? Man, pray, pray for your husband. Do you pray for your husband? You know what, you may be the only person who is praying for your husband. What if you were to pray for him every single day? What would God get up to in that man? And if you don't know what to pray for, there's a beautiful book by Stormy O'Martian, and it's called The Power of a Praying Wife. And it's got heaps of ideas in it. The Power of a Praying Wife. But you know what, here's another way you could work it out. You could ask your husband, when was the last time you asked your husband, what can I be praying about for you, honey? And then zip your mouth. Just listen and take it to Jesus. So pray for your husband every day. Pray for you as a wife. Look at yourself as a wife. Pray that God will reveal things to you, change you, soften you, do something in you. Think about the qualities you want to see in yourself as a wife and pray about them. And pray with your pray for your marriage. Think about the qualities you want to see in your marriage and pray about those. And always pray with thanksgiving. Every single day, give thanks for your husband. Give thanks that you're his wife. Give thanks for your marriage. Thank you, thank you. And something will shift in you. If you are in a negative space, something will shift in you as you begin to give thanks. You know, some of you have been praying for years and years and years for your marriage. And you've seen very little change. For some of you, you prayed for years and years for your marriage and now you're separated or divorced and it's, you wonder, you wonder about this. Maybe you're in another marriage now. A couple of things I want you to hear in addition to what I've just said. First of all, you are not responsible to change your husband and you are not able to change your husband. You can pray for him, but you can't change him. He'll stand before God on his own. Secondly, you are fully responsible for you, 100% responsible for you. So start praying about your own heart. Start praying about your own responses, bringing God in, letting God's spirit work in you. Yeah. So read God's word, pray every day. And thirdly, plug in to God's power by Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. How about you turn there? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. And this is what it says. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you walk by the Holy Spirit, then you will not be following the ways of the flesh. You will have that victory that the Spirit of Christ is crying out to, crying out for in you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, takes that a little bit further. You see, when you come to the Bible and you read it, it's not just an intellectual exercise. And when you pray, it's not just mindfulness. You need to plug in to the Spirit of God in your Bible reading. You need to plug in to the Spirit of God when you're praying. You need to say, God, I want to walk in the Spirit. And then this, Ephesians 5, 18 to 20. Do not get drunk on wine. Well, that could be a word for someone today. Uh, which leads to, this is a beautiful big word, debauchery, which actually means wastefulness. So much wastefulness if we live a life of getting drunk on wine. Instead of that, be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that be filled is a continual filling day after day, moment after moment. Be filled with the Holy Spirit every single day. 
Call out to God. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. As a woman, as a wife, if you're a mum, as a mum, wherever you work, as a whatever I am where I work, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill my marriage with your Holy Spirit. Ask God to fill you with with his spirit, to take more of you, to clean you, to change you, to illuminate you, empower you, and live through you. And as God points out something through the Bible or in prayer, bring it up to him and cry out to the Holy Spirit for his work in you. He is the holy God living in you. He will do it. He's the third strand. And then look at what will happen as you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? As you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your heart fills fills up on songs you see the spirit in you is always singing and so what comes out of your mouth is beautiful what comes out of your mouth brings God joy and glory and it's it's worship it's praise it's thanksgiving you'll be surprised you'll find yourself singing you'll find the spirit bubbling up in you and overflowing don't stop and don't shut your mouth let it out who wouldn't want to be a woman like that filled with the Spirit, overflowing with the beauty and goodness of God. God is the third person in your marriage, the third strand, and he's always working for your marriage. He's your power source. He gives you the power over the flesh. Plug in. Plug in. Read your Bible every day. This is your homework for this week. To every day, Read God's word. Every day, pray for your husband, for yourself, for your marriage, for the filling of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, talk to your accountability partner about this. Have a chat with her about what's going on in you and all that we've just talked about today. Next week, we're going to take a big giant leap into what it means to truly, really, honestly respect your husband and what he thinks that means. So that's going to be good. Hey, my heart is filled with joy as we finish today and as I think about all that God has for you and uh, in your marriage and I want to pray a blessing on you. So join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I praise you that you have filled us with your Holy Spirit. I just praise you that every follower of Jesus is filled with the Spirit of Christ. And right now, Lord, I pray for every wife who is listening to this right now. I just pray, Lord, that she would have a life that is just open to the Spirit, open to your power, open to your revelation, open to your word, a life of prayer and praise. And Lord, would you just flow out of her, give her victory moment after moment after moment over that dirty old flesh that wants to live and yet has been crucified. And Father, I pray that she will know the joy of that third strand in her marriage. Thank you, Lord. What a wonderful promise we come to. Thank you, Father. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Wonderful. Hey, I'll see you next time. Have a great week. Bye.